Okay, <clears throat> let's uh, get started. First, a couple of ground rules. I enjoy questions, as long as they're of a general character. Okay, that is, <clears throat> um, if you asked me, uh, and my back's been hurting when I do this, right? <clears throat> that wouldn't be necessarily helpful for everybody else. If you said, well, help me understand the difference between osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, that would be a more general question. Is that fair enough? So general questions are appropriate for a larger audience. We don't want individual questions to kind of bog us down as a group. I'm going to take the first half and have a look at osteoarthritis, so you'll understand something about the aches and pains that tend to bother most of us as we get a little bit older. And then we're going to do a switch over to back pain, uh, and I'll give you a general overview, uh, help you understand how to deal with the most common kinds of back pain. Fair enough? Okay, here we go. Osteoarthritis, what a pain. Oh, <clears throat> This is a picture that I took in Yosemite National Park. For some reason, the Sierras remind me of a backbone. <laughs> the backbone of the earth, right? It's the skeleton that holds it all up. The, the uh, soil is gone and have this beautiful granite. Right back over through the pass is uh, Tuolumne Meadows. And I just, it's a very uh, beautiful place which I love to visit. Well, <clears throat> This is what a normal joint looks like. This happens to be a knee joint. Do you recognize it? Of course, x-rays allow us to see the bony part, but not the other stuff. So we've got the upper bone, which goes up to the knee. We have the lower bone, which goes down to the ankle. This one is looking from back to front. It's a little hard to see the kneecap in there, but you see a space in here between the two bones. What's in that space? I heard somebody say cartilage. That's right. Cartilage is tough, fibrous material. It has no calcium in it, so we can't see it on the x-ray, but yet it's holding weight. You might consider it a sponge sort of a thing, but a sturdy sponge, maybe a... No, felt wouldn't work. It wouldn't be hard enough. But a good sturdy material. Now we have two convex surfaces. That is, the bones are round this way and another round one coming from the other side. How do you get two ground bones to really move together well? Well, there's something in it called uh, uh, meniscus. Have you ever heard that word before? Yeah. And a meniscus is a piece of this cartilage, like what lines the joints. It's, consider it kind of like a triangle, if you will, and it goes all the way around the joint. Okay. It's actually twice. Okay, a wedge would be a good way. It goes around each side. So that helps those two convex surfaces. One of them is attached to the other one kind of will move with the bone above it. We also have some ligaments to keep this, uh, this bone... Uh, from in line, this knee bone. There's a ligament on each side, one on the middle side and one on the outside. That keeps it from moving side to side. There's another one inside. If we were to look on this x-ray, which is taken from the side, there's a, a ligament, a tight ligament, that goes from the back on the top down to the front on the bottom, and then another one that goes from the top on the front to the back in the bottom. And those two we call the cruciates. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? They cross in the middle, cruciates, so that's where they get their name. And those are really important to help the knee keep from sliding forward to backwards. Uh, you'd, you'd like it, that'll keep it from moving, so that's what that's all about. And we do a test sometimes where we where we uh, will pull the knee forward to see if that ligament is, is loose. And you can actually see the lower leg slide forward if the anterior cruciate is torn. Have you heard that? In sports, we hear that a lot, don't we? Anterior cruciate is torn. Well, it's the one that goes from the top and the back to the front and the bottom. When it's torn, the knee will slide forward. It's unstable and more likely to cause somebody uh, or lock up or cause pain. So. Let's see, we have the patella, 
that's we, the common name for that is the kneecap. The muscles go up to the quadricep, uh, or up here, we'll pull on that. This kneecap is then attached by a ligament down to this lower bone, and that helps us straighten our leg out. Big muscles moving a lot. Those of you who have been taking like physics, remember that in, in uh, college or high school? We just studied something called uh, fulcrums and lever arms, uh, something like that, right? <clears throat> and when you do the math on it, if the fulcrum or balance point is here and there's an inch out this way and <clears throat> what, 12 inches back here or 18 inches out here, let's say, you put 100 pounds here, that's 1,800 pounds over the, uh, the uh, It's incredible forces. I wonder that it actually works as well as it does. Incredible forces as we bend down and then stand up again. So these forces are rubbing the cartilage together on a, a regular basis. Now, it might surprise you to learn that the cartilage, that sponge, hard sponge stuff inside the joint has no blood supply. So without blood, how does it get its oxygen and its nutrients and those types of things? It comes through the lining of the joint, all around the joint on the outside, well at least on the sides and I think on, on the back, but more on the sides, is something called synovium. S-Y-N-O-V-I-U-M. And synovium has uh, blood vessels that come into it. Now these blood vessels are quite special. They're called end arteries. If you uh, block up a blood vessel in a muscle, it's no problem. There's another way around. There's a detour, if you will, and the blood will get there. But in end arteries, there's no detour. You have an artery splits into two, and then into four, and then to eight, and there, without any detours, it goes to the smallest of the capillaries. This ends up being very important for the knee joint because the pressure of the blood in those capillaries, each red blood cell has to fold in two in order to go through those small capillaries. So the pressure that it takes to do that makes the fluid in the serum or in the blood leak out and go into the joint. That takes in some, some uh, blood sugar that, or some glucose. That takes in some oxygen. That takes in other things that the body needs, that the cartilage needs. And that pressure then pushes the nutrition into the joint. On the far side of the capillaries, there's a little bit of a vacuum and it, start, it pulls out the waste. So no blood supply to the joint. Things heal rather slowly in there. That uh, will be important a little later on. So now we review. Bone, fortunately it's not bone on bone. There's cartilage or this kind of tough uh, fibrous sponge material. Then the ligaments which keep the knee from moving too much. And then this synovium that brings the nutrition and then the blood vessels that of course bring the nutrition to the synovium. Well, since we've got a pair of good knees and we happen to be in Yosemite National Park, let's take a uh, walk down this old, uh, the original Coulterville Yosemite Highway. You know those pictures that you see with the, from Yosemite with the old uh, wagons coming through and some of those old original cars? This is the road that they took. It's no longer uh, driven on with cars, but you can take it for a walk. And since we've got a couple of knees, we might as well head down that trail. It's only 1.5 miles. Well, <clears throat> we're going to need a couple of normal hips, too. <laughs> so here's an x-ray picture of a hip. I took it out of a, uh, uh, a textbook, and you can see that there's a ball in a socket. You can see the bottom edge of the socket and the top edge of the socket and the, the arrows and the little triangles are showing you the front and the back of the socket. So it's a three-dimensional sort of a thing. The ball goes in and it moves. Does it make sense? Uh, what's in this space between the uh, ball and the socket? Does anybody know? Cartilage. Cartilage, good. 
A little bit of synovial fluid as lubricant. No, it's not oil. It's actually water and some uh, protein type things, okay? So the lubricant and, and of course there's the synovium too, but that's going to be kind of around the outside of the joint. So you understand something about normal hips and normal knees. And of course, having normal joints remind us of beautiful trees, doesn't it? And there's one we pass on our, tre our trek. Well, the disease process called osteoarthritis is, and this is from the textbook, so don't expect that you have to understand it. What it's saying is this. There's more breakdown than there is buildup in the cartilage. <laughs> and when there's more breakdown than there is buildup, then we say uh, uh, that joint has osteoarthritis. It starts to get bumpy. It may even wear away. And you'll see some pictures. By the way, what does the word arthritis mean? Do you know? Itis means inflammation. Good. And arth means joint. It's, it's any joint. Is a, have you heard of an arthropod? I think that's an insect. Or, uh, they have, you know, joints that move. So the arthro means joint. So osteoarthritis is the most common kind of inflammation in a joint, or arthritis. Can you think of any other uh, kinds of arthritis besides osteoarthritis? Rheumatoid is a very common one. That's, that is correct. Rheumatoid arthritis happens, it's much less common, it happens when the immune system gets confused and instead of fighting what it's supposed to, it starts to fight the joints. That makes inflammation in there. Any other kind of arthritis you can think of? What about traumatic arthritis? That is, you were in a, an accident, a car accident, right? And your knee got hit really hard. Maybe there's a broken bone that went into the... I mean, that would be a traumatic arthritis, wouldn't it? Uh, anything else that might cause uh, arthritis in the knee? Inflammation in the knee, or any joint for that matter. The bursitis? Bursitis is, a, is inflammation in a bursa rather than a joint. But it's a, it's a very important thing because there's a lot of bursas around the knee. And sometimes people get diagnosed with arthritis when really what they have is a bursitis. So that's an important point, and we'll come back to that. Inflammation inside a joint might be caused by, and I know you all thought of this and we're just afraid to say so, an infection, right? So you could have an infectious arthritis, and they can be viral or they can be bacterial. Uh, I'm thinking of another one. Anybody ever heard of uh, gout? Gouty arthritis? These are crystals that get inside the joint. There's even a pseudo-gout. It, it's crystals inside the joint that can make it inflamed. So you see, there's lots of different kinds of arthritis. And what we're really focusing on uh, this evening is the osteoarthritis, which is what that definition is all about. Okay, now you see it. This is a very bad hip. I took this from a textbook, too. This is not one of my patients. I'm glad, okay? Can you see the space between here? The cartilage is gone, isn't it? It's bone rubbing on bone. As a matter of fact, recognizing that the whiter it is, the more bone there is, this bone rubbing on bone has actually been stimulating the bone to try to make more and cover for the problem. So that's why it looks so dense here, and we can't see the line. You can see a little bit of the line down here, but it's worn away. The damage is so much that the cartilage has been destroyed. Make sense? Now, I, I told you I was glad this isn't my patient. This is the hip from autopsy. So you can see this, this same hip that we have the x-ray here. See all the bone trying to cover for the missing cartilage? This hip really hurt to walk on. Look at here. <clears throat> this is the ball of the hip. Down here you can see a little bit of the cartilage with the white. 
This is a, a regular photograph, not, not an x-ray. Up here, there is no cartilage at all. It was just bone on bone. That is severe osteoarthritis. By the time, well, before you get to that point, I would recommend having a hip replacement because that can really, really hurt. Well, a bad joint like that is kind of like a dead tree, isn't it? It's not very pretty at all, and it certainly wouldn't help us on our walk. Osteoarthritis. How do you know if you have early osteoarthritis? Uh, most of you will know right away that you, if you have really bad arthritis, but what about the new arthritis, early, uh, just starting rheumatoid, or not rheumatoid, osteoarthritis? Here's the classic one, pain and swelling in a joint that gets worse after a period of rest. That is, <clears throat> you uh, get up in the morning out of bed. When you first get up, oh boy, those knees or that hip hurts. Five, ten minutes later, oh, it's okay. I can move now. That would be classic osteoarthritis. There's a little swelling in there as the body's trying to fix it. Uh, <clears throat> Rheumatoid arthritis, by the way, generally lasts quite a bit longer. The pain would take maybe two or three hours to go away. Generally, osteoarthritis is going to be 10, 15, something less than about 30 minutes. It's what we expect. So that's the most common kind of arthritis. As it advances, it gets to the point where there's limited motion. If I'm talking about a knee, instead of being able to bend all the way back, it's bending less far than it was that would tend to give us some clue that there was some reactivity in there and some, of the, some bumpiness was making it hard to move. And then this whole business of nighttime pain. And I'm glad you brought up about the bursitis. I've seen this over and over again. I, I, just a few months ago, I had a lady uh, come to one of my diabetes classes and she said, my knees are terrible. I'm going to have to have them uh, replaced. And I, I said, okay, sometimes uh, doctors will say you've got bad osteoarthritis and they'll forget there might be something else they could help with. Does your knee hurt at nighttime? And she said, yes. And I said, let me examine your knee because there's very likely a bursitis. See, osteoarthritis generally, until, unless it's really severe, does not cause pain at night. So if your joint hurts at night, I'm saying, could there be a bursitis in there? And indeed, I found a bursitis, I injected the knee, and she had like an 80% improvement in her knee pain. You see? Because I had found the right diagnosis, and additional to the right diagnosis of osteoarthritis, I found another thing that I could do something about. Okay? And the little cortisone injections help to decrease the itis, takes the itis out of it. So uh, that's helpful. Yes, sir? It can be very helpful. It do, you don't get a lot of systemic effects. You certainly don't want to inject it into a tendon because it will make it weak. But it can be really helpful. And while I don't like to do it first time trigger, if I have someone who can't exercise and their diabetes is getting worse, I'll do it in order to help them get exercising. It's, to me, it's an adjunct to the lifestyle component. No, no, you're just trying to break this. It, you can't use it continually, you get into trouble. Yeah, but, but the, my rule is three times in three months. That's what I was taught. Okay, after that, it's the orthopedist's job, okay? So that we can do. Usually, it's one time and you're done. Uh, but sometimes we go back and repeat it. With no damage from using it. Well, if we use it wisely, yeah. yeah it's not, they're not all bad, but they have to be used carefully. You don't want to be using it willy-nilly. That's right. Yes, ma'am. Does that have to give it time for the itis to, to subside? Well, no, it's actually, it, it's a very, uh, the cortisone is a very strong anti-itis. So it stops uh, itis. Yeah, it just, if you get it right, if you put the cortisone where the itis is, it'll stop it. That's what its job is. You see, cortisone is, is kind of what we've come close to, what the body makes called cortisol which is the body's anti-inflammatory, and we're just adding a little extra in one spot. <coughs> What's a bursa? Excellent question. You know what an arthur is. <laughs> it's the joint where the cartilage meets and the bone kind of come together with the cartilage. A bursa is a potential space. Let me explain. 
On your elbow, when you move it, you have skin that rubs over top of the bone, right? And because the bone is sliding, there is a potential space. And that's a bursa, right in there. If it gets inflamed, and we don't know exactly why it happens, we might have bumped it on something, you can get a great big tennis ball on your elbow from that bursa swelling up. It's a bursitis. Now there are many bursa in the body in different places, especially around joints, because that's where things have to slide. So the knee, for example, will have several major bursa and a bunch of minor ones. So I would put the cortisone in the one that was causing the trouble if I was using it. I mean, that's not our focus tonight, but I want you to know that it is a legitimate thing to do. It can be very helpful for people if it's used wisely. The important principle here that I was hoping that you would learn would be if you have pain in your joint at night, question the diagnosis of arthritis, osteoarthritis. It may actually be a bursitis and need to be looked at. Uh, more carefully. Any joint can be affected with osteoarthritis. The hips, the knees, which we've talked about, the fingers. As a matter of fact, uh, osteoarthritis most commonly affects the distal joint on the fingers and the second one back. It doesn't usually do these back in here. If these back in here are affected, that's more likely to be an uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So these distal ones are the osteoarthritis joints. Base of the thumb as well. Yes? This was considered which one? The, the ones that bend in your fingers are the ones that are osteoarthritis. The one that bends with your hand is the rheumatoid arthritis joint. Yes. Your knuckle, if you will, is the rheumatoid arthritis. And then the base of the thumb that is all the way down in here can be one of the osteoarthritis ones. So uh, the spine, really any joint, in the, even the jaw. Anybody have a cracking jaw? <laughs> a little bit of, of osteoarthritis in that jaw can happen sometimes as well. The jaw joint, the toes as well, the ankles, sure, all of them, any joint can be affected. If we're going to treat this, our goal is to decrease pain, increase function, and if possible, slow or reverse the disease. And we talk about disease modifiers. Now, when a doctor looks at this, standard medical treatment is, and you've probably heard of these, NSAID stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. You've heard things like ibuprofen, indocin, um, uh, Meclamin. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different ones that you may have taken. These <clears throat> do not make the joint any better. They do not decrease the inflammation in the joint. And they often cause an upset or bleeding in the stomach, right? So while we use them, we have to be very careful and wise about them. And, and it's not best. If you're going to use a medication for pain, Tylenol is a better choice. The anti-inflammatory part of this does not do very much for the anti-inflammation of the joint. It's just handling the pain, and Tylenol does better with that. Now, we drop down to this next uh, class of treatment. I remember when I was in medical school, residency, this glucosamine sulfate was being talked about, and patients would come in talking about it. And true to form, the uh, doctors would say, <laughs> I mean, this is over the counter, there's no proof, that doesn't work. Orthopedists were kind of laughing at it, and then somebody did a scientific study and said, hey, that stuff works. And it appears to be disease modifying. It may actually slow the progression of the disease. That's true of glucosamine sulfate, but not of chondroitin sulfate. The studies have not shown this to be beneficial. Now, I see a lot of uh, orthopedists who are actually ordering the glucosamine sulfate. And we know this stuff, you eat it in your mouth, it gets into your joints. It helps with the cross-linking in the cartilage. So there is a mechanism by which we can understand that it is beneficial. It is glucose, what does that sound like? Yeah. Amine, what does that sound like? It's protein. It's a glucose protein kind of connection. My memory is they make it from limpet shells. 
So it's, it's uh, not exactly a plant product. It's an animal product, but it's an animal product like uh, uh, calcium carbonate, for example, which would be the shell, uh, outside shell of a uh, 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 sea animal uh, often. So glucosamine sulfate may be beneficial. I've had patients tell me, oh, man, I started taking that stuff, and a week later, my joint pain felt so much better. I've had others tell me, I took it for three months, and then it started to work. I could tell my knees were getting better. I've had others say, I took it for six months, never made any difference. It was a waste of my money. Okay, so there's a, some individual uh, variation here, and it... it uh, it, it may be helpful for you, and it's something that you could do. <coughs> she says, he says, does it have side effects like ibuprofen? It has no side effects like ibuprofen, but it does have some side effects. Did you notice it's called glucosamine? People with diabetes may find that their blood sugar goes up a little bit. Studies looking at it have found that the hemoglobin A1C doesn't go up, but people have noticed that their blood sugar may go up a little bit on it. So that's because it's glucose amine. Okay, but glucosamine and They often put them together. I've never been able to figure that out. I was worried. I'm not so worried about the limpet shells, okay? The chondroitin bothers me a little bit because the most readily available source of chondroitin is the byproducts of you know, all the cow processing we do. And with mad cow disease, it's going to be coming from cow cartilage. Very likely, so I'm really afraid of that one. I would try to get glucosamine without chondroitin sulfate. I, I thought they did. You have to look for it, but I, I think it's out there. That would be my recommendation. Uh, of course, that's up to you. Here's another one that's been noticed. Arnica Montana gel. Ar Arnica Montana is a, an herb. They put it into a gel. You put it on the outside. And I saw a randomized controlled double blind study on this one. So they gave the cream to two. One was a placebo. The other was the cream. And found that it did help the joint feel better. Decreased pain and help the function. So there's a little something that may be helpful for you. Uh, menthol uh, used topically may be helpful. And then, maybe you all have heard of MSM. MSM has also been demonstrated to be of some help. This was a pilot clinical trial where they found it to be helpful. We don't have the highest level of evidence on this, but uh, it's not bad. So MSM may also be helpful. Now we're getting to the area where I'm much more interested in uh, making a difference. And I think this is much more powerful and much more important. And that is the whole physical therapy end of things. What can you do with the joint to help it restructure itself? Here is a, uh, uh, a study done in Australia where they took a group of adults and divided them into three groups. They had osteoarthritis of the knee. They were randomly assigned into three groups. One was to receive a phone call with encouragement. <clears throat> one was to get walking type exercise. And the other one was to get pool exercise, that is walking in the pool. So three different groups, and then they evaluated to see how they did over time. So <clears throat> what happened in the exercise group is they had improved thigh muscle strength, improvement in walking speed, and, pa and patient satisfaction. My knees feel better when I walk. Now that might be a surprise to you. When we're talking about a disease that seems to be a wear and tear disease, that is, we use it too much and it starts to wear the cartilage down, how or why would walking more tend to make it better? So th there's a little question about that. But movement is good for the joints. And indeed, the more we strengthen the muscles, the better they do. Those that got the hydrotherapy exercise found their walking distance increased, they improved their physical uh, function component, and improved their quality of life scale. When they added the pool walking to it, uh, it was even better. Now, I suppose that makes sense, right? It's joint movement using muscles, but you don't have to bear so much weight because we tend to float. People who are heavier tend to have more osteoarthritis because they carry more weight, at least in part. If you get in a pool, that means you, the, the uh, 
fluff tends to float, right? Which means you don't have to carry so much weight, which means the joints get to move and exercise without being damaged as much. So it's beneficial. And I would recommend, here in Florida, there are quite a few people with pools. Great exercise to go out and walk in the pool uh, to help out your knees and or hips. Just swimming around a little bit, unweighted, to move that joint can be very beneficial. Okay, and very last on our list is this thing called surgery. Again, I don't own a knife. But I would want this the very last thing. Of course, if I couldn't exercise at all, my weight tends to go up, my diabetes and hypertension and heart disease get worse. So I want to get those joints fixed, whether it's a knee or a hip. They used to say, <coughs> we don't do surgery if you, let's see, even if your knees are bad, if, if you, it looks like you're going to live longer than 10 years, especially if someone is really overweight, because the joints, the artificial joints, just wear out. And replacing a worn out joint is really a scary sort of a thing. I know one of my patients several years ago, probably 12 years ago, had had a joint replacement and he wore it out. He wasn't a heavy fellow, he was a thin fellow, but he was active. And it took 12 or 13 years. The guy was 85 years of age, and he was going well and strong. But that joint was wearing off, so he had it replaced the second time. And the second time, he got an infection in it. And it just wouldn't heal. He was given a choice. We either fuse it, and he, I think he just lost hope. It, it, I think emotionally, he died from that. And of course, the infection and everything. I was uh, sad for that. So we always want to keep that surgery as kind of the last resort, not something we jump into quickly. The good news is there are new joints available, the new space age ceramic. They are expecting 30 years, and they're much more willing now to do these joint replacements on people who are a little bit heavier, recognizing it's next to impossible. You have somebody who's real heavy and has bad knees, and you say, you have to lose 100 pounds before I'll operate on you and then they can't exercise? How do you lose weight well without adding the exercise component? It's a lose-lose. It's an impossible proposition. So the orthopedists are beginning to recognize that, and in their meetings, they're talking about it. We need to operate uh, on even people that are heavier. So uh, that is more likely to be done. Of course, you can have joint replacements in fingers, and you probably know about hips. I don't know about any neck replacements. And I haven't heard about any toes, but I mean, these joints can be replaced in a lot of uh, different areas. The very best thing that you can do for osteoarthritis to help restructure the inside of that joint is passive range of motion. Does that phrase make sense to you? Let's take it apart. Passive means you're not working, right? It's happening to you. It's not active, it's passive. Range of motion is the joint moving. So, for example, for my elbow, my active range of motion is from there to there, right? So that's active range of motion. Now, passive range of motion is when the other hand does the moving, see? Because something else is doing it. It's not the joints, the muscles of the elbow that are moving it. What does that do? Well, much like walking in the swimming pool, it takes the pressure off the joint because the muscles aren't pulling over it, and it massages the cartilage inside the joint. That massaging helps that cartilage smooth, get smooth, and it will slowly smooth with time. I was introduced to this by an orthopedic friend of mine. When I was in residency, he was doing research at Loyola University there in uh, the Chicago area. He explained to me something that was very interesting. Have you ever noticed your leg, if you look right straight down it, it gets to the knee, and then it doesn't go straight anymore. It kind of bends out a little bit. Have you noticed that? That's normal. It's about two to three degrees. We would call it valgus, for what that's worth. The kneecap rides over the little bone in the knee, like we saw earlier. That riding kneecap will begin to ride a, a little bit to the outside because 
the leg is kind of bent to the outside at the knee. So because it's riding to the outside, it starts to get some bumpiness under it. And my orthopedic friend said to me, he was studying this stuff, he said, where do you think the bumpiness is? You think it's on the outside where it's bumping up the bone, or you think it's on the middle side that's not rubbing on anything? And I said, where it's bumping up against the bone, of course. He said, no, it's on the side that's not bumping. It ends up that cartilage does much better if it rubs over itself. And if we can do that without any incredible forces, like trying to lift ourselves up, why, that cartilage can restructure. Hence, this thing called passive range of motion. Somebody else or something else moving that joint can help restructure. Incidentally, to make this knee better, uh, when that get the bumpiness, I've got a little bit. You want to hear it? Yeah, yeah, you hear that? Yours do that too? A lot of us do. It's a little bit of early osteoarthritis, I hate to admit it. All right? But <clears throat> good news is it's reversible. Uh, a study was presented at the orthopedic meetings, at least this is what my friend shared with me, where they scoped inside the knee, they took pictures of the bumpiness, they put people on an exercise bicycle or a regular bicycle on level ground, for two hours a day, and then scope the knee every three months. At 15 months, they found that the bumpiness was completely gone, and the knee was like new again. Wow, you can actually reverse it. Isn't that exciting? You can do something about it. Now, in my experience, in my practice, when I have somebody with the usual osteoarthritis of the knee, I tell them an hour a day, and generally, in our experience, I'm saying our because it's mine and my patients, it takes about six weeks and for most people with knee pain it'll go away using an exercise bicycle with the resistance turned all the way to zero. <laughs> so it's not exercise for your heart, it's just one goes up, the other one goes down. You get it going and keep it going. About an hour a day. I tell them don't watch TV unless you're sitting on a bike. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and just around and around, and that passive range of motion helps to restructure that cartilage, make it smooth. The other thing you can do is to strengthen the medial quadriceps, and we do that by turning the toe out and lifting the hip up straight. Okay? So hold, lift it up, count to six, put it back down. Do it not from your knee, it's from your hip. Okay? Not with your knee. You want your knee perfectly straight. Lift up from your hip, toes out. When you get really good at it, get a Walmart bag and a can of green beans. Start over again. Okay? And that'll bring that kneecap back in the middle so when you're walking and moving around, it's not sliding over, and that should keep it from happening again. Make sense? Passive range of motion is a wonderful thing. It's really hard to do with your jaw or your spine. <clears throat> So it's not available for all our joints. A little hard to do for fingers, too. Hips, I think you can get it a little bit of hip with the um, exercise bicycle, but boy, you better set the seat up really, really high. By the time people start having hip pain, they tend to have limits in how much they can bend their leg up. So you uh, have to be a little careful about that. But if you can just barely touch the pedal with your toe, then it won't come up quite as high. And you can get that same passive range of motion in your hip. Any questions? Does that make sense? Passive range of motion is really important for osteoarthritis. And that's, that's the big take-home message, as far as I'm concerned, from osteoarthritis. We'll add a little more to it, but passive range of motion is the best lifestyle treatment that I know of. Oh, there's some incredible machines, very expensive machines. I, I, that's why I suggested this uh, exercise bicycle, and I tell people, don't buy one, because everybody and their cousin has one sitting in the garage or the bedroom, right? I mean, it's covered with clothes. <laughs> uh, borrow it. <laughs> They'll be glad to be rid of it for a while. So, yes, sir? It's just for knees and hips and mainly That's where it works best. Some of the others, it's harder to do but yet it would work for those joints if we could, right? Shoulder, 
I suppose you could do shoulder pretty easy, couldn't you? If it was truly an osteoarthritis of the shoulder, you can kind of swing it a lot of different ways without having to put too much pressure on it. If you were liking to exercise by equipment, you still set that thing where there's no... Zero resistance. Okay. You want it to move without, with a minimal amount of muscle use. Okay? That's right. Just so that's the passive part. Yes, ma'am. Yes. When there's been uh, a lot of damage in the knee, they'll get some itis in it, inflammation. Inflammation tends to pull fluid in. And so doctors will sometimes, to help relieve the pressure on the knee, put a needle in and suck the fluid out. It's not my idea of a good time. I don't even like doing it to people. You know, it's a big needle and it goes in. <laughs> But yes, it can be helpful sometimes. I've yeah. heard of something called trigger finger. Trigger finger. She asks about, asks about trigger finger. Trigger finger is a little bit of different. It's not really an arthritis, but it's somewhat related. The, the muscles that, uh, that run our fingers are not so much in our fingers. They're in our arms. And there are tendons that go up through the hand, past the hand, front and back, and make the fingers move. Right at the base of the fingers, there's a pulley. And you can understand that because if there wasn't a pulley, then you'd have the tendon going right straight across there. So it's got a little pulley in the palm of the hand. And if there's a swelling in the tendon, it can get stuck in the pulley. And then when you pull the finger down, it gets stuck there and it doesn't go up real easy. And it kind of locks in there. So that's a trigger finger. But that's a little different than osteoarthritis. That's correct. She's having a hard time with the concept. It actually took us as physicians quite some time to figure this out because it wasn't intuitive. You see, you, you break it down by walking on it and now you make it better by moving it. it, it there's, a, there's something, maybe we should rest it, is what we thought. Well, it ends up that the body is made for movement. And passive range of motion, that is the movement without the muscles and the force, allows the repair to take place. So it produces new cartilage? It helps the cartilage replace itself, yes. Mm -hmm. Does, water, hot and cold water. Does hot and cold water help? Let's move on to the next piece of our lifestyle treatment to help you out with that. Uh, we, I want to talk a little bit about diet and how that may affect, because it can make a big difference as well. This is a study out of, yes, Russia where they looked at fasting as a way of treating osteoarthritis. When they fasted people for several days, and I think they did like five to seven days, they found that people's joint pain went away. Isn't that interesting? Well, uh, let's take that little piece of information and move on. <clears throat> Remember those end arteries I was telling you about that were, they divide, divide, divide till the red blood cells have to fold over? Well, if red blood cells are sticking together, they don't go, the, the, the uh, circulation in that synovium is very poor. And high sugar and high fat tend to make red blood cells stick together. I remember, I learned this first from my grandmother just before I went to medical school. She had the whole family over for a meal. And after the meal, she passed around my favorite oatmeal and raisin cookies. I took three. And when I had scarfed those down, she came around again. So I was grabbing another three, and I said, Grandma, why don't you eat any? And she says, every time I eat something sweet, my joints hurt more. I've heard that story over and over again since that time. It has something to do, I think, with this uh, plugging up of those very small blood vessels that go to the joint. If the blood isn't flowing there, things aren't working like they're supposed to and pain and osteoarthritis develops. Diet can have something to do with it as well. Omega-3 fats, maybe you've heard of these. These come, yes, from fish, but we make them ourselves if we eat enough of the plants. Even tomatoes and lettuce and cabbage have omega-3 in them. You don't have to get them from fish oil, 
God has put them into most all plants. But when you have enough omega-3, it decreases inflammation in the body and the joint pain tends to get better. Now, this next one is a fascinating one by me. It's a, a plant food. I'm going to read this to you. My suspicion is most of you won't understand it, but I'm going to go back and try to explain it, okay? The efficacy of avocado soybean. Now, you know what avocados are, and we know what soybeans are. But this says, avocado soybean unsaponifiables. Now, that's a weird one. In treating osteoarthritis of the knees at a dosage of 300 and 600 milligrams was consistently to superior to placebo at all endpoints with no difference observed between the two doses. What does this mean? It's something from avocados and soybeans. Here's what saponification means. That has something to do with fat. What they mean is they whiz the, the uh, avocados and the soybeans up with detergent. They washed away everything that would go with the soap. And what was left, they put in a pill and they fed to people with osteoarthritis. And it made their joints better. Isn't that weird? Now, here's something that's fascinating. The scientists do not know what it is in the avocados and the soybeans that makes the joints better. They just know it's not in the fat part. <laughs> okay? So that's been washed out. It's something that's not on the fat part, and it tends to help the joints. It, whether you get 200 or 400 milligrams, you know, 300 or 600, it doesn't matter. The improvement to the joints is exactly the same. To me, this drives home a very important point. And if you haven't learned this lesson, I think this is one worth learning right now. Doctors don't know it all. <laughs> <laughs> We're still learning. We're just scratching the surface. God has put things in plant foods for our benefit. And the more of those we eat, the more benefit we'll have. That's the food that God designed for us in the garden at the beginning. He added that meat stuff later. And uh, I think that was because there weren't enough plants. <laughs> but there are enough plants now. <laughs> so let's eat the plants and gain the benefit from that. Yes? He says, is that in stores? Now, that, I take that as a direct insult. <laughs> I assume you mean as a pill. I, I know, you know the avocados and soybeans are in the... Yeah, they did. But don't get stuck with the crazy scientists. Eat the avocado and the soybean. <laughs> you see, when somebody gets the Nobel Prize in medicine for discovering this stuff, putting it in a pill and selling it to you, you can say, you can laugh at him and say, I've been getting it all along, thank you. <laughs> because you're eating it the way God made it, the way it was supposed to be. Uh, how much avocado, how much soy? Okay, enough. I don't know. <laughs> I'm saying that soybeans are good. Now, I didn't use the V word, okay? Because in my study, I've discovered that it's really not vegetarian or vegan that makes somebody healthy. People get really sick. What matters is how many plants you're eating. If you're a meat eater and you're eating a lot of plants, you can be a whole lot healthier than a vegetarian who doesn't eat very many whole plants. If we're eating the whole plants, we're getting it. The more it's processed, the more human beings tend to take it out. Okay? So, an important lesson that I'd like you to take home and put under your hat. Okay, niacinamide is a vitamin. You take it as a drug in huge doses. It opens up blood vessels. Some evidence that it makes the arthritis better at first, a little later on, long term, it may actually make it worse. So I'm not sure that it's really a good idea. Okay, <clears throat> that kind of takes us through what I, that shares with you what uh, I wanted to share with uh, osteoarthritis. Best treatment is a plant-based diet, low in fat and sugar, with lots of good exercise to keep the joints in tune. If you have problems with osteoarthritis, then passive range of motion is the best way to take care of it if you can. That's better than pills, and you can actually, with time, restructure the inside of a joint. So that should be good news. Any questions or comments before we move on to, oh, my ache and back? Oh, WD-40, I love this. 
I thought maybe the best thing to do is mix WD-40 with DMSO, right? And rub it, because the DMSO would take the WD-40 in, and the problem is the lubricant in the joint is not an oil, okay? It's a carbohydrate, it's a gel, it's a protein, it's water. And I don't think, I, it was a great thought, but let's put it to the side, okay? <laughs> yes, sir? What about carpal tunnel syndrome? Now, that is not really a uh, arthritis. That's, uh, I'll spend a little time on that uh, so, so we have some time left over for back. There's a nerve that runs, we call it the median nerve, right up the wrist into the palm and gives sensation to these three fingers and a little bit of uh, muscular uh, support, or it talks to the muscle in the the muscle at the base of the thumb. There are also, what, nine tendons that run in that same space. There's bones in the back, there's a tight tendon over top, and if that starts to get tight because of swelling, inflammation, arthritis, or maybe just we're getting fat and there's a lot of extra fat around, that nerve can get pinched. Uh, that space is pinched and the nerve begins to complain. Usually what happens, is uh, people get tingling at the tips of their second, third, and fourth finger. Sometimes when they're using a computer, most commonly it happens at night. It wakes you up. Best way to take care of it at night, and this is classic, is just hang it over the edge of the bed. And uh, then it tends to get better. Of course, if you've got both hands bo uh, bothered, uh, <laughs> then uh, you need a narrow bed, okay? <laughs> Now, I had carpal tunnel syndrome. I get it. I still get it occasionally, especially when I do heavy physical work. My father had his operated on uh, and got them taken care of. And I said, I'm going to have to have my done. So I had the nerve conduction study where they shock you to see how things go. And then I um, f f got a friend of mine who's a hand surgeon. This is easy stuff for him. And I said, would you fix it for me? We set a date. And I started telling my patients. I'm going to go get my carpal tunnels taken care of. I'm going to be out of the office for a few days. And one of my patients said to me, oh, don't have that done. I was going to as well. But then somebody told me to do this. And he showed me something. And, and, uh, and then I didn't have to have it done. I've never had it done. I said, what, what was it? <laughs> I, I like to learn from my patients. <laughs> and so he showed me. And I started doing that. And in two days, the symptoms were gone. And I said, I canceled the surgery. And I still haven't had it done. So, oh, you're a curious bunch. <laughs> well, what he told me to do, what he told me to do, and I've been trying to explain it, I haven't found anything in the literature on it, I just know it works, and it's helped some other patients as well. Uh, even recently, I shared it with somebody. <clears throat> There's a band that goes across the wrist, and I think what, ha what happens, if you move it all the way to this side, you stretch the band this way, you move it back this way and you stretch the band this way, when you get done, it's a little bit longer band and it releases the stress. So this is what he showed me to do. Are you ready? Use my elbow with a completely relaxed wrist. But you have to keep your hand in the karate chop position. Some people have a real hard time with this, okay? And <laughs> so it's got to be done from the elbow. This has got to be relaxed enough, but you have to have enough to keep it from going. And for those of you that have carpal tunnel syndrome, if you do it right, you kind of feel the feeling goes whoo into your fingers and goes, oh, that feels good. <laughs> well, that wasn't exactly arthritis, but it was taking charge of your health. If you happen to have a, a, a carpal tunnel. Okay, let's move to back. Oh, I, one more question in the back. Yes, sir. Traumatic arthritis? Uh-huh. Traumatic arthritis and osteoarthritis are very similar. Uh, osteoarthritis is slow trauma with slow healing, slower healing. And traumatic arthritis is fast damage. So... <clears throat> Generally, the osteoarthritis or the arthritis from trauma will be pretty much immediate and will continue to bother. The good news is that that 
For example, in a knee, a passive range of motion may very well help to smooth that out. Although often the damage is quite a bit more with traumatic arthritis. Yes? Will heat help? Will heat help? Heat increases blood supply, and as much as the synovium needs a blood supply, it's beneficial. Uh, I think the passive range of motion is probably more important because there is no blood supply to the cartilage. So it's that motion along with the diet that I think is a little better. I've no, no studies that I know of that compare the two, but that's my understanding. Not that heat might not be beneficial. Okay, let's move on to the back. Are you ready? Okay, oh my aching back. How are backs put together? They're fascinating organisms here. You've got a, a vertebral body. That's the tough bone that is supposed to hold the weight. Behind that is a ring of bone in which the spinal cord and nerves go. This isn't completely accurate, but it's pretty close. You've got the spinal cord with its coverings and then nerves which exit in a little space uh, above and below each vertebrae. This picture here gives us the spine from cervical, thoracic, to lumbar, and then the sacrum. This is looking from the back, this is looking from the side, and this is looking from the front. On the front, you can see the little discs in between. Have you all heard of discs? The bone is the hard part. We can see it on x-ray. The disc has no cartilage in it. Or, I'm sorry, it has cartilage in it. The disc has no calcium in it, so we cannot see it on x-ray. It, um, it has a very tough fibrous outside, and it has something, the consistency of jello in the inside. So as you take a step and your heel strikes and your back kind of jolts, the, the jelly inside, it works like a shock absorber, kind of pushes out on the fibers. And the fibers, because they're tough, don't move very far, but they stretch a little bit, and it creates a shock absorber for the spine. So there you see them, uh, the ring of bones in the back with the spinous process. These here all have ribs attached to them until you start getting down to the lumbar region. Looks like 12 up to, uh, uh, what's that, T1, I guess. So, uh, and then here it is from the side. You can see the holes here where the nerve comes out. When a disc herniates, have you heard that? A herniated disc? The weakest spot is right next to that hole where the nerve is coming out. So if it pushes out, it can push up against that nerve and cause some pain uh, and or weakness and or trouble. So that's an introduction to the anatomy. Let's look at, uh, I took this from my anatomy book from medical school. Pretty impressive. Here's the spinous process. That's the piece of the back that you feel when you feel your back. There are muscles on each side, so they run up here. Here's the body that's supposed to carry the weight. Here's the little uh, uh, place where the nerve is supposed to go. Then there's a joint that goes to the vertebra below and a joint that goes to the vertebra above. These are little joints. They're not meant to carry weight. Keep that in mind. Here you see it from the top. I think this is from the top. The body, there's the ring where the uh, spinal cord and nerves go. The nerves would come out on the side here. Here's the little joint above, and down back behind you can see the joint below, and there's the spinous process. So that's a picture of uh, the vertebrae and how they work, all stacked up, the weight supposed to be carried on the front or body of the spinous process. I'm sorry, of the vertebral, of the spine. Okay, here's an x-ray. What do you think? <clears throat> you can see I uh, took it from a textbook again, right? There's some, some writing on it here. These are the vertebral bodies. What's in here? The disc. And you can see where the nerve comes out here, right? And if the disc herniated, it could push up against that nerve. So that anatomy is easy to see. Uh, we talked about the facet joints, these little joints in the back that aren't supposed to carry weight. You're looking at one right there. There's the one from above, there's the one for below. They're kind of like shingles all the way up the back in, in how they work. So. Uh, that's a, an x-ray from the side showing you what the spine looks like. Wow, look at this one. Do you know what? This spine has really bad osteoarthritis. We talked about that earlier, didn't we? Poor healing because of 
uh, probably related to a poor diet. High in fat, high in sugar, keeps the blood from flowing. So instead of healing in a smooth sort of a way, it heals in bone. And they, the radiologists even call this beaking. You see how the bone kind of reaches out almost like a bird's beak, trying to touch as, the, as the, what should be soft tissue is getting tough. So <clears throat> these are the vertebrae instead of being square, they're getting this extra calcium. And this is called osteoarthritis of the spine. Now, <clears throat> I guess the bad news is, is that it looks terrible. The good news is that it doesn't have to hurt. Osteoarthritis of the spine does not have to cause pain. If somebody comes in with an x-ray like this and back pain, I cannot honestly say, you have back pain because that x-ray looks terrible. There's something else going on. And if we can fix that other, even an x-ray that looks this bad, someone can be uh, uh, pain-free if it's just the osteoarthritis, or certainly a whole lot better. So, the causes of back pain. What can cause back pain? We've looked at the anatomy. Uh, you could have trouble from bone. You could have trouble from nerve. Or you could have trouble, anything else? Or muscle. Okay, a disc, but a disc is pushing up against the nerve, right? So a disc is generally really a nerve problem. So we've got the muscles, the bones, and the nerves. Those are the three things. Now the most common cause of back pain is muscle pain. Bones happen sometimes if you're kind of bending and twisting back and you push those facets together, occasionally you jam those together. I had somebody the other day who had that happen. Oh, that's just really uncomfortable. Nerves herniated disc. Have you ever heard of the sciatic nerve? It starts with about three or four of these uh, nerve roots. It goes down inside the pelvis. It goes on some people through a muscle and heads down all the way down the leg. Anywhere it's irritated along there, it can cause sciatic uh, pain. And that's pain that radiates generally down. Uh, so that's a nerve involvement. So these are the three most common, and muscle is by far the most common. It's classic. I put the box in the closet when I moved into the house five years ago. I've given up my exercise program. My wife wants something out of the box. It's the closet is full. I can't just reach in and pull it, pick it up like I'm supposed to. So I kind of reach in at an angle. What have I just done? Well, I've put all the force on one side, haven't I? <coughs> And then the box wasn't heavy when I put it in, so I yank on it up and it doesn't move and I'm twisted. And that muscle starts to tear and I go, oh, that hurts. And maybe I can finish the job and the next morning it's really hurting. Maybe some of you have had that experience. That would be classic and the most common kind of problem. Diagnosing these problems takes an exam and uh, some clinical acumen. We're not going to be an able to answer everyone's uh, uh, back pain problems tonight. When I look at somebody who has uh, back pain, I think muscle, bone, nerve. Which is it? And if I get done with the exam and the history and everything, I say, it doesn't sound like bone, doesn't sound like muscle, doesn't sound like nerve. I say, there's got to be something else. What could it be? And other things can cause back pain. Things like prostate problems, things like uh, colon, even colon cancer can show up as back pain, or infections, sometimes infections in the spine or in joints. So I start to think of other things, not uh, uh, the, the uh, main three. Sometimes even cancer shows up as back pain. I don't think I put on here, uh, back pain can also be caused by an aneurysm which can be deadly. So if it doesn't fit muscles, bones, and nerves, I'm thinking about something else. Okay, what can we do for the common back pain, the muscle uh, spasm? I heard somebody say, <coughs> exercise. <laughs> uh, it's getting almost that way, isn't it? When you're in church, you know, in Sabbath school or Sunday school, the answer is always Jesus. 
And here, I guess the answer is exercise. So I guess that's good. And diet, okay. So you know what the right answers are, and that helps. Okay, this is how it works. And we talked about picking up the box already. When a muscle starts to tear, immediately there's a reflex. God built it this way. The whole muscle relaxes, which is why you kind of drop down immediately, is because that muscle just quits. And that's a, a protection. There'll be a little bleeding, sometimes a lot more bleeding, and often later, the next morning, the pain is really bad. The muscle <clears throat> has swelling now and inflammation, so it hurts from that standpoint. It begins to recruit other muscles, and they get tight to try to protect it, and that can cause even more pain. With time, over the next six weeks, two months, three months, that heals up, and it turns from bleeding and inflammation to scar tissue. You know what scar tissue is, right? You've seen it. Somebody gets a burn on their arm, and what happens to that scar tissue? It pulls, doesn't it? Kind of distorts. The same thing happens in, 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 inside the muscle, too. So the muscle fibers are, the scar tissue pulls them in this way, and then it also pulls this way. So the muscle may be pulling this way. Now the fibers that are attached to the scar tissue are actually shorter than the ones that are on either side. Meaning, it's a whole lot easier for you to hurt that again. So what we want to do is to minimize scar tissue. If you have scar tissue there, we want to stretch it. Does it make sense? And then, of course, strengthen the muscles around so you're much less likely to put the strain on that scar tissue. Okay, heat is very beneficial. As you brought up earlier, heat brings blood to the area. The more blood, why, I guess the more supply of oxygen and food for repair. What's more, the body is simply a whole bunch of biochemical reactions. And the hotter it is, the faster those chemical reactions take place. So when you put heat on it, you're actually speeding up the healing process. So heat can be very beneficial. The problem is, if you put a heating pad on your back for two or three hours, you'll make your back worse instead of better. Because it apparently sludges the blood in there and can cause, start to cause trouble. So it's a minimum of 20 minutes and a maximum of 60 minutes on heat to your muscles on your low back. That may be beneficial. Of course, this would be later on, early when you've just heard it, you want to put ice on. Ice has another, and we'll talk about that. But heat can be very beneficial 20 to 60 minutes at a time. Now, after you've had the heat on, increasing the healing process, bringing the blood to help with the healing process, wouldn't it be nice to exchange the blood and, and send that blood that's been working and kind of sludging somewhere else? The well, best way to do that is to bring some ice because ice makes all the blood vessels constrict. So blood vessels got big, a whole bunch of blood comes, now the ice and the blood uh, goes away. And you can do that for a short time and then put the heat back on and you get a new batch of blood. So by cycling hot and cold, this can be very beneficial. Let me tell you one of my favorite ways to do the ice. Take a styrofoam cup, fill it full of water and put it in your freezer. Now, <clears throat> you've had your heat pad on your back for about 20 minutes and you have your spouse or helper get the ice out of the freezer they peel the top of the cup off. They can hold the back of the cup and massage your muscles with the ice. Now, that sounds cold, but remember that heating pad's been on there, and it's feeling really hot, so the cold it actually feels pretty good. Now, ice has a benefit besides constricting blood vessels. It also decreases pain. So if I were uh, recommending you... Uh, this treatment to you to do at home for your back pain, what I would say is alternate the hot and cold for three or four times, and then just before you go to bed or just before you quit, end with ice. But this time, do the ice a little bit longer. First it feels cold, then you have the little pins and needles, then it goes 
kind of like there's a deep cold pain if you've had frostbite you know what that is and then it goes numb stop when it goes numb because you don't want frostbite <laughs> but that cold can help decrease inflammation just like those drugs non steroidal anti-inflammatories the ice can do that so it works in that uh, that same way and can help you sleep a little better too, help break that cycle so I like heat and ice and of course hydrotherapy the hot and cold can also be done with hydrotherapy hot tub that type of a thing physical therapists will do the heat with an ultrasound machine to get the the heat down in the muscle it doesn't have they have a way of getting through the fat a lot easier than uh, external heat although they, though they often use both let's see what's next on the list rest <clears throat> well we want to use this word carefully well, but when we say rest, we don't mean go to bed. We've discovered that if you just go to bed with your lumbago, it'll take you longer to get better. This is another one of those things that's kind of odd. If you keep moving, you get better faster. Okay? It works that way with back pain as well. So rest means uh, keep moving, but don't do whatever it did that hurt your back. Okay? Try to uh, uh, minimize the pain. Don't be lifting in a bunch, but keep walking. Uh, keep moving don't just go to bed medications yes they may be helpful uh, uh, we don't the same ones we mentioned before uh, and they may be helpful posture is going to be very important and muscle strengthening uh, <clears throat> there are four muscle groups that are important for the back let's look at them the obvious ones are the back muscles right they help hold our back up when we're lifting something up they help us straighten up so that's one group and very obvious the next group is not quite so obvious but it is pretty important and that's the stomach muscles you see <clears throat> the weight should be carried on the front of the spine on those big tough thick bones so the back needs to be straight if the muscle pulls between the pubic symphysis and the rib cage, you see how it straightens my back out? Gets rid of the low curve when these are pulled together. So stomach muscles are very important. The third group of muscles go from the front of the leg over the hip and attach to the middle of the back. They're the ones that you really use when you do a sit-up. When I was in high school, I hated sit-ups. And one day, one of my fellow students came in and said, you know, the doctors say you're not supposed to do sit-ups. I wish the coach would have listened to him. I hated those sit-ups. Later on, I understood why. You see, if that muscle gets too strong, then when you're standing up straight, that muscle is pulling your back in, and it increases the curve in your back. So now the recommendation is that you do something called a crunch rather than a sit-up. You don't actually use, make that muscle uh, too strong. One of the worst things you could do is a whole bunch of sit-ups and then have a job where you just sat all the time because that muscle gets really short when you just sit. And if you, if you kind of get it muscle-bound by doing too many sit-ups, you can make it too short. When you stand up, your back curves in, the weight moves backward and tends to put more stress on the spine. So. Back muscles, stomach muscles, front leg muscles, the last group are the butt muscles. Now that's not really intuitive either, is it? But let's explain it like this. <clears throat> butt muscles decide whether the pelvis tips forward or backwards. If the butt muscles are loose, the pelvis tips forward and the back has to curve a lot in order for you to stand up. Now, I'm trying to exaggerate it to make it easier. A few millimeters makes a big difference on your spine. And increasing that curve in the low back really puts you at risk for back pain. So, if these butt muscles are kept tight, it tends to tilt the pelvis back and the spine can go up straight. One doctor I heard lecturing on this several years ago put it this way. He said, I tell my patients to pretend they have a $5 gold piece between their cheeks and they're not to drop it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's a, a, a good thing to remember. Some of you who have had some back training, 
may know that if you have some back trouble and you're doing dishes, for example, at the sink, it's a lot better for you to kind of put your foot up like this. What that's doing is tipping that pelvis back so it, it helps to straighten the spine and move the weight to the front of the spine. So there are exercises that you can do to help keep your back in shape. I had to uh, uh, chuckle. My father-in-law back pain had back pain for a long time. And we finally gave him some back exercises to do. And as long as he does those back exercises, his back doesn't hurt as much. So that's a, 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 an important sort of a thing. It makes sense. If the muscles are in tune, then the whole back works better. Now, if you were to come to my office with back pain, it's very likely I would give you a copy of this little book called the Back Owner's Manual. And I like it because it, it's got some cute cartoons in it. It tells you how to lift and how not to lift and, and how come a straight spine is so important. And they've got some nice little pictures, but what's really important is in the, towards the back are a series of back exercises. And if you wanted a good, strong back, you're having trouble with your back, doing these exercises on a regular basis is likely to be very helpful for you. Now, <clears throat> these are copyrighted, but I understand that if you, uh, if you copy things for educational purposes, that it's OK. <laughs> and you all didn't pay to come in here, right? It's free, so it's education. So I made uh, copies of the exercise sheet. Uh, and they should be in the back. Now, I made 50 copies. And it looks like there's more people than 50. So maybe couples could kind of share. And I wanted to make sure that there wasn't a stampede. <laughs> if it's a problem, why uh, we'll try to get a copy for you later. What about scoliosis? Very good question. Scoliosis is a twisted spine. When it gets very severe, it, it uh, restricts the breathing and can cause major problems with uh, the function of internal organs. It's actually rather common and usually does not cause a problem. Scoliosis, unless it's severe, should not cause back pain. If someone says, you have scoliosis and, you have, and that's the cause of your back pain, I always want to think about that and say, maybe there's something else I can do something about. Because scoliosis, unless it's severe, usually does not. Where does it come from? We're not 100% sure. I think maybe it got its name, scoliosis, right? Maybe it's too much school. Maybe <laughs> carrying all those books on one hip. <laughs> no, we don't know. Uh, but if it's progressing too fast, uh, 18 degrees, and it stabilizes generally about 18 years of age. If it's accelerating, then sometimes they'll go in and do surgery, but that's very rare. So I don't know where it comes from. So it gets weak control of the spine? Well, it, it's imbalance in the muscles for one reason or another. And we don't know all the reasons for it. People are generally not born with it. I think it's something that develops over time. Not to say that somebody couldn't be born with it, but usually it happens at school age kids, 8, 9, 10, and up through. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there it is. We finally made it all the way down the hill to the big redwoods. And they are amazing, aren't they? This is my wife, Dina. You can see her standing next to the redwoods. To me, it looks like she's just finished a pedicure on a very large elephant. <laughs> Well, we've uh, taken an hour and a half of your time. I trust you found it useful and helpful. All the questions haven't been answered, but you've been given some direction that may be helpful for you in dealing with your arthritis, your osteoarthritis, and your back. It's been a pleasure having you. Next time... Thank you. Next time we're planning on talking about getting old and liking it, or uh, <laughs> getting old, uh, doing a, making it easy, or something like that, gracefully. Yeah, that'll do. So we'll look for you next time as well.